I'm pleased to introduce my colleague and friend Robert Rockhouse from the University of California, Santa Barbara. He's a native of uh, the California coast down there and um, spent uh, most of his educational, uh, higher education experiences uh, north in Berkeley uh, doing a BA, MA, and PhD at UC Berkeley. Uh, after grad school, he worked for a time in management consulting with McKinsey. He spent time in the military and law enforcement. Quite a varied career. Uh, rejoined academia uh, a few years ago when he took a position in his hometown at UCSB, where he's an assistant professor of political science. Specialties are in international security conflict management. He's uh, currently finishing a book on third party intervention in conflicts. and. Uh, uh, in addition, starting a new project on nuclear weapons. Um, one of his uh, mentors, I should say, at, at uh, UC Berkeley, Ken Waltz, was uh, one of the leading voices in, a, in an argument that suggested that nuclear weapons actually promoted peace. And I think um, we've asked Robert to come out today and think hard about that question. He's entitled his talk, Do Nuclear Weapons Promote Peace? And I'm delighted to introduce him to you, and he'll talk for about 30 minutes and take your questions. Thank you, Wade. Thank you, Corey, for inviting me out. Um, I've only been here basically half a day, but I'm basically overwhelmed with um, how special of a place this is. And you can just see that, um, especially coming from uh, UC Santa Barbara, which is a top 10 party school. It's academically quite good, but we're ranked quite high. And um, it's just amazing to walk across a campus where you see students studying instead of nursing hangovers. Um, so it's a pleasure. <laughs> It's a true pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> it's always a bad sign when a speaker starts with a disclaimer, but I uh, was overtaken by my daughter's flu yesterday and lost my voice. Unfortunately, I think it's back enough that I'll be able to get through the lecture, but um, if I'm a little bit difficult to understand, my apologies. Um, I always like self-explanatory titles, um, so it's pretty obvious what I'm going to be speaking about today. Um, but let me tell you where this is coming from. This is probably going to be my next book project, and this is one slice of it. I've started off with something I usually don't do. I've started off with a very empirical set of questions, and I've gone about trying to get evidence. <clears throat> Normally, I spend a lot of time developing theory, so what I'm really giving you is um, the first piece of this that's very statistical and quantitative. I know it's a, it's a mixed audience ranging from undergraduates to professors, so I'm not going to go into the details and intricacies of the statistics. But with that said, this is certainly not in any way a dumbed-down um, lecture. I actually think it will hopefully be a more interesting one because um, I think, at least at UCSB, my undergraduates often ask the most interesting questions. And when I can give lectures that are substantive instead of technical, it usually makes for a more um, interesting time. <clears throat> there are, let's see if I can get this thing going. The left, oh, there we go. Um, there are three things that I'm going to do in the talk today. I want to talk a little bit about nuclear deterrence theory, what other people have had to say about whether or not nuclear weapons promote peace. I'm going to lay out my basic research design. I'm not going to get into a whole bunch of detail because it gets into statistics and case um, data sets and um, just gets more technical than we need to be. And then I'm going to back out of it and talk about the results. And I'm going to try to get through this all on the quicker side to leave plenty of uh, Q&A, which is oftentimes the, uh, the best part of these things. <clears throat> Do I need to actually point this in a direction? The, the, compu the computer that's controlling is back there, but we can just hand. Why don't you just go ahead? Is it? Um, thank you very much. You Let me just to make sure. Is it, it is the left button yeah. to a? It's supposed to be, but there was a problem with the layering, and so is it working now? Back yes, but now we're one too far ahead, okay, so we got to go, go back one. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I'll just ask you to advance them for me. Thank you. Um, do nu nuclear weapons reduce the chance of war? Kind of an interesting thing here. According to theory, and actually even according to most of the policy debates that you hear out there, it's actually a definitive yes. Even the people that are very critical of nuclear weapons, if you really listen to what they're saying, the underlying premise that nuclear weapons promote peace is still intact in what their argument is. Do nuclear weapons promote peace? Proliferation optimists, people like Ken Waltz, John Mersheimer, John Lewis Gaddis, and others, their basic tenet is World War I was pretty devastating. 
prior to World War I, there were high levels of interdependence. Norman Angel and other people were saying global consciousness had changed. There shouldn't be big wars. World War I happens. It shocks Europe. Less than 20 years later, World War II happens. How does that happen? Now you have this big, great war. Things start to recover. There's the memory of the horrors of World War I, which in some ways were harder on France and Britain than World War II. And you get another big world war. At the end of World War II, we're starting this big Cold War between the US and the Soviets, two titans with completely antithetical ideologies. Everybody expected World War III. And you get almost half a century without another world war. Why? Uh, proliferation optimists say it's because most of the great powers have nuclear weapons. And nuclear weapons, because they are so destructive, they're cross-cultural, and you don't even have to be very smart to understand they're really bad. And because of that, states will be very reluctant to engage in conflicts directly with one another over stakes or things that will escalate to a major war. There's a lot of uh, different people that are lumped into the proliferation pessimist camp. And when oftentimes when I put this slide up, it takes people a second to fully realize the truth of what I'm saying here. The proliferation pessimists actually believe that nuclear deterrence promotes peace. But they're saying, but. There's safety critics like Scott Sagan. They're saying nuclear deterrence might have prevented World War III, but there could have been an accidental exchange that would have led to World War III. There could be loose nukes that Al-Qaeda could use. There could be an accident. So the safety concerns overwhelm the positive effects of them. But they don't deny that the actual presence of nuclear weapons reduce the chance of war. There's also rationality critics, Bob Jervis, um, Stein, Ned LeBeau, and others. And a lot of times people read their work and they think they're being critical of nuclear deterrence theory. They're not being critical of nuclear deterrence, promoting peace, but what they're saying is people aren't perfectly rational, they make mistakes, things can go wrong. They're worried about deterrence failures, but they're not actually criticizing the underlying logic of nuclear deterrence. Moral critics, both academic ones like Falk, but also this is probably where a lot of the policy debate is, especially, let's say, for the American or European left, is that nuclear weapons are immoral. It's an immoral form of warfare because you're targeting civilians. But that doesn't get at the issue of whether or not they increase the chance of peace. So most of the critics really are agreeing with this logic. It's kind of when you really think about it, it's a little surprising. There's another group of scholars that say they're not really sure, that it's unclear. They tend to kind of still go in the category of overall <coughs> nuclear weapons probably promote peace between the states that have them in terms of a major war but they might facilitate small wars or adventurism or proxy wars or wars in the periphery. And the logic behind this is as follows. If two states have nuclear weapons, they realize if they have a major war with one another, it's mutual suicide. It's committing suicide. So they're not going to do that. But since they know that the other side knows that, and they know that the other side knows that they know that, and that there's some threshold that neither side will go above, Maybe you can goof around now and have lots of small wars because you know there's some ceiling that you can't get across. So this is called the stability-instability paradox. And because of that, maybe nuclear weapons will reduce big wars, but they might allow lots of small wars. So depending on how you measure things, is it total number of wars? Is it total numbers of wars with some calculus for their size? Um, is it battle deaths? What's the calculus? Depending on the calculus, you're going to get different answers about whether or not they promote peace. I'm having a hard time, and I'd, I'd appreciate help on it, finding people that say, no, nuclear weapons do not promote peace. And so forgetting the unintended consequences, the side effects, the pathologies, but that they actually don't promote peace. I'm putting Vasquez and Mueller in here reluctantly, because when you read their abstracts, the jackets to their books, they're saying nuclear weapons do not promote peace. They've had nothing to do with preventing World War III. But when you actually read the logic of the book, of the books, it really says, Peace was overdetermined because of learning, because of a zeitgeist, because of changing norms, because of um, uh, interdependence, a whole bunch of reasons. We would have avoided World War III even without nuclear weapons. That's still not saying that nuclear weapons haven't helped enforce the peace. So it really could be that nobody is undermining the logic of deterrence. And I'm not saying that the moral and safety issues and other things don't matter, but that's actually quite possibly profound. 
Um, would you mind flipping the uh, slide for me? Um, I'm not going to go into great detail here. The point of this is most of the discussion of the actual effects of nuclear deterrence has been anecdotal case studies, qualitative work. There's nothing wrong with that type of work, but this is a question that is ripe for statistical analysis. And we're for the democratic peace or for interdependence, whether independence promotes peace and democracy. These things have had dozens of books, maybe hundreds of books, hundreds of articles, maybe thousands of articles. But statistically, only three people have looked at um, this question. The most recent one by Roland Beardsley is a very good study. Um, there's, it's, it's not definitive. There's a few technical um, issues and qualms that I have with it. Um, but there's a few people now starting to, uh, starting to look at this. Next slide, please. All right, so we're going to move on to research design. You can flip it one more. Um, <clears throat> I'm performing a statistical analysis. I'm using a data set that's called the Correlates of War data set. If you Google it, there's a lot of interesting stuff um, on the Correlates of War project for those of you that are interested in international relations theory. Um, Correlates of War is basically try to go back and catalog every war over the last couple hundred years. As people were doing statistical analyses, they were discovering that if you only think about wars, and it's defined as a certain number of deaths within a certain period of time, that there might be selection effects in your thinking. So if you only focus on the wars, what about the close calls like the Cuban <coughs> Missile Crisis or small interventions that were not able to get at those issues? And so the data set was expanded to include what they call militarized interstate disputes. So this will pick up things like the Cuban Missile Crisis. This will pick up things like President Clinton's military action in uh, again, the airstrikes against Somalia, things like that. The date range um, for my study currently is 1885 to 1992. I'm doing that to show that I'm replicating other people's work. Obviously, I'll drop cases eventually because there's no point to go pre-45. <clears throat> In order to understand what I'm doing, I need to mention something about dyadic structure. What this data set does is, let's say today in the world there's something like uh, 193, 94 countries, I think. Last time I checked, there seems to be more breaking off monthly, um, somewhere in the 190s. And what this data set does is it will take pairs of countries. So it's 191 countries times 190 times 189. You multiply that out, it tells you how many cases you have just for this year. And it does that going back in time. And for each of those pairs, it either says if they're at war or not at war. So going back over time, it ends up with you having 320,000 dyads. The dyadic structure, you'll see when I talk about how we try to test for nuclear weapons, becomes very important. I'm using regression analysis. I'm using a specific type of regression analysis. I'm not going to get into any of that. But the whole point by regression analysis is it helps control for independent effects so that we really know we're talking about nuclear weapons and not other extraneous things. And I'll, I'll make that um, example more clear. Next, please. Um, Logic dictates that when you're thinking about dyads, there's just three types of condition. Either both states have nuclear weapons, one of the two has nuclear weapons, or neither does. So for what I've done in the data analysis is I have two independent variables. Remember, independent variables are your explanatory variable, dependent variable, it's the outcome variable, it's the thing to be explained. So for my independent variable, I basically got two. It says whether or not this dyad is an asymmetric nuclear dyad or whether it's a symmetric nuclear dyad. If, if it's either, if it's asymmetric, it gets a one. The other variable, if it's symmetric, it gets a one. If no nukes are present, it's a zero. Okay, so that's just very simply what the uh, variables are doing. Next, please. Um, I had to go back, figure out when states proliferate, when they actually get nuclear weapons. This isn't an easy task, actually. Countries like India and Israel, it's unclear. Um, there's also a debate about, is it when you have the know-how? Is it when you actually have the availability? Is it when you actually do the testing? Is it when it's weaponized and deliverable? Is it really when you have a second strike capability? There's some debate about this. The good news is I've tested it all the different ways and it doesn't make a difference in the results. Next, please. Um, my outcomes that I'm trying to explain, I really believe in trying to be thorough. And one of the problems is um, in a lot of the literature, people just look at militarized disputes. And so they'll say something like the democratic peace, that democracies are less likely to fight one another. If you look at almost every study published in the last 10 years, it doesn't say that at all. 
It says democracies are less likely to engage in crises with one another. They don't actually limit to war. And it, I, when I say this, it boggles people's minds, so they go back and start looking up all these Russet and O'Neill and Mao's articles, and they go, you're right. It isn't the democratic peace. It's the democratic non-crisis. We don't know that it necessarily avoids war. So I test for different types of things, and they're each more restrictive. So in the center is war, which I'm the most interested in, is loss of life. And I want to be able to say something directly about that. Next, please. Um, this isn't really the proper language to call these control variables, but essentially what I'm doing in the regression analysis is I'm including other things that could be explaining my outcome. So are the states next to each other? One of the biggest predictors of violence is proximity. If you live with somebody, there's a greater likelihood of violence. You're more likely to act violently towards your neighbors, right? Think about it geographically. If you can't actually touch a person because they're too far away, there's not even a chance of violence. So you have to control for all these issues. It's controlling for whether it's a democracy or authoritarian regime, if it's a major power, what their power capabilities are, et cetera. So all these control variables are included. And to just drive home the point of why this is so important, let me put a slide up that will hopefully provoke, and hopefully people will not have, maybe a couple of the hands will go up and won't be able to solve it right away, which always makes it more entertaining. But go ahead and give me the next slide, please. The best predictor of IQ is shoe size. I can incredibly reliably predict IQ based on shoe size. And this is not a joke. It's about the best predictor you can get. Anybody want to take a stab at why? Yes? Very good. BYU students are way ahead of the other audiences I've been at. <laughs> Very good. Go ahead and show me the next slide, please. Once you hit 14 years of age or older, there's no correlation between shoe size and IQ. But my daughter's 19 months. Her feet are like this big. She eats dirt. She eats bark. She eats anything she can get her hands on. And when her feet are probably this big, she'll be a bit higher up on the IQ scale. Right? But at some age, it's not going to have an impact. And a lot of times in statistics, especially in things that you read in distinguished papers like the New York Times, there's other things that could be driving the study, and if it's not controlled, you don't really know what's driving it. So all those control variables I was just mentioning, I'm doing my best, although it's still imperfect, and you can never be sure with statistics, I'm doing my best to try to get to the point where we've isolated the effects of nuclear weapons. And you can go forward two slides, please. Um, thank you. So we're into the results section, section three. What do we find? Um, these are the two new independent variables, the symmetric nuclear dyad for if both states have nukes. The bottom row is whether one state has nukes. I really had no dog in this fight. I'm a student of Ken Waltz, so I nominally would love to be supportive of his views. And as I was going through this analysis, I actually realized we don't really have much theory. We really haven't thought, what's the difference between symmetric dyads and asymmetric dyads? What's the difference between a crisis versus a small war versus a big war? When you actually go out in the literature and you try to read the theory, what I really discovered is people are talking past each other. Waltz is making an argument about symmetric dyads. When we're concerned about Iran acquiring nuclear weapons, we're concerned about asymmetric dyads, what Iran will do to other states around it that don't have nuclear weapons, or we're concerned about what Iran will do to us at a lower level of conflict, like sponsoring terrorism against the US. And so when I really started to think about it, it's really unclear what all these hypotheses are. Now today's talk, this is totally atheoretical. I'm not going through enlisting hypotheses and what people say. This is just very fact-based. But when I looked at this, it's just very surprising. It's very different from what I expected. In every case but one, nuclear weapons are associated with an increase in conflict. They're making peace less likely. They're increasing the chance of militarized disputes for both symmetric and asymmetric dyads. They're increasing the chance of force for both asymmetric and symmetric dyads. And they're increasing the chance of fatalities for both. They're also increasing the chance of an actual war between asymmetric um, dyads. And we can talk about that. That's po that could possibly be counterintuitive. A lot of game theorists and people that do formal modeling and really are into nuclear deterrence theory, they tend to believe these things are calming in general. But then there's that one box up there in the top right, and that's really 
when you really look at Ken Waltz's argument, that's the box that he's really been in. He said nuclear states will not fight one another in a major way. That's his claim. Nuclear weapons prevent World War III. So Waltz is right, but all the other people that are sometimes concerned about the pathologies or unintended consequences, they may be right too. So we're in kind of an interesting situation where people are talking past each other, the pessimists aren't really criticizing the, the nuclear peace, and now I have results that say everybody's kind of subscribing that there is a nuclear peace, and it may actually turn out that nuclear weapons have been wonderful at avoiding World War III but maybe not so good in terms of all the other things that they're doing out there. And then there's the moral issue dimension, and there's us doing somewhat of a calculation. How many lives are saved by avoiding World War III versus all the smaller Koreas and Vietnams and Iraqs that have happened? And um, you can do some calculation. I was talking to one of Wade's colleagues this morning about exactly that sort of thing. Um, so what are the kind of high-level takeaways on this? Go ahead and flip the slide, please. Effects of nuclear weapons are complicated. I mean, most of the public debate is they're good or they're bad. They're moral or they're immoral. A lot of the academic debate is deterrence works or deterrence fails. Or we've got to be worried about the safety issues. But there's been so little effort to actually really go about testing what's going on, what the real empirical evidence is. <clears throat> There's a wonderful book I'd recommend to everybody in the audience. It's, um, it's an easy read. It gets into theory and bigger stuff happening in the field, but it's um, accessible and user-friendly. It's called The Spread of Nuclear Weapons by Ken Waltz and Scott Sagan, and they debate each other back and forth. Um, one writes a chapter, the other one responds, and then they debate India, Pakistan, some other things. Just a great book. And uh, it never occurred to me that I could actually find results that show that both of them are correct because everybody thinks about this book as a debate, but I had Waltz and Sagan out to uh, UCSB and moderated, and one of the first questions I started to really hammer Scott on was this issue of he really rejects nuclear deterrence. And he fundamentally doesn't, and he's not making a moral argument against it either, so I was saying, you know, for the third edition, they should bring somebody in that actually doesn't like nuclear weapons, because it's kind of one hand um, clapping, which is a good way to describe this debate. Where I'm headed with this project, the next step is I'm going to be developing a couple game theoretic formal models, and I'm specifically going to look at this stability-instability paradox. And for those of you interested in nuclear deterrence theory, I would encourage you to investigate the stability-instability paradox. It was first written about in 1965. It's been mentioned a handful of times. Uh, it's been mentioned a lot. Somebody's act, people have actually done studies or projects or papers maybe half a dozen times. And it actually looks like Len Snyder's, Snyder's brilliant chapter in the Seabury book might have actually been the right explanation, that there's this strategic stability, but that while the U.S. and the Soviet Union know that they won't have a big fight directly, they're willing to do all sorts of stuff through Cuba and Nicaragua and the Horn of Africa and even pretty big wars in Korea and Vietnam. So that part of the stability and stability paradox is true but also that kind of just general concern about why don't we want Iran to have nuclear weapons? Why don't we want it to have? If they have them, it means we can't regime change them, and we already have ours, so they can't regime change us. We should be okay with it. And when you push Ken Waltz on that, he kind of says, well, yes, in the big picture it avoids wars, but what does it do in the smaller setting? Does it make Iran more resolute? Does it make them more likely to try to destabilize things in Lebanon? It does, because it's a, it's a castle wall. It's a protective barrier for them. We always think that offensive weapons allow you to become more violent. But defensive weapons can, too. If you have a castle, you can go out and do all sorts of things to other people if you know you can retreat to your castle and they come, can't come back and harm you. So if Iran has this nuclear shield to step back behind at an asymmetric level, of course there could be a greater chance of conflict. Now, the argument that most people make against that, why my results are a little surprising, would be if somebody gets nuclear weapons and they have more coercive leverage, if people are rational, the other party should know that and they should become more willing to compromise. So it should kind of offset itself. There's various reasons why um, that may not be the case. And um, I promise to try to keep it short and leave lots of Q&A, so I'd actually like to just stop there and try to take as many questions as possible.
try to follow a pattern so it's so we can take as many questions as possible. So uh, if we don't call you exactly in the order to put your hand up, but keep your hand up and we'll get to you. Let's start over here and then work our way back around. Hi, my name's Todd Doty. I'm from Stockton, California. I'm a physics major. And my question is, um, how do you think that the proposed nuclear shield that Bush wants to set up would affect these relationships that are being set up here? There is real debate on what, on what the effects are. Ken Waltz and the sort of nuclear optimists and a lot of the game theorists think that it's very bad um, for lots of reasons. Um, one is a lot of academics aren't big fans of the U.S. So one of the concerns is that if we can protect ourselves, it gives us more degrees of freedom to do things abroad. So there's a normative piece to the argument quite frequently. <clears throat> there's also, Waltz um, makes an argument which I hadn't thought of that's just brilliant, which is if you create a nuclear shield, it's going to cause other states to just multiply how many weapons they have to overwhelm your defenses. Because remember, deterrence, what do they have to hit to, make, to deter us? New York? L.A.? You know, one city is enough that if you even think one nuclear weapon is going to get through to a major population center, you're going to become pretty reluctant. Um, so Waltz's view is that it will lead to this multiplication of our adversaries or the U.S. getting weapons to make sure we can overwhelm other states. I'm actually of the mind that Waltz is undermining his own argument. I think nuclear weapons are so destructive and that they resonate so deeply in us that we understand how destructive they are, that you could have a shield that is 99.999% accurate, and you're still going to fear somebody else retaliating against you. So it might affect a North Korea, which might have, you know, eventually, I think right now they can hit what I always refer to as the freak states, Alaska and Hawaii, right, the things that aren't contiguous. They can maybe hit our outlier states but they can't hit the mainland. Maybe if they had one or two or three missiles, maybe the shield could be destabilizing there. It's not going to be destabilizing for China or for other places. And you know what? Frankly, I don't think even if we were 99, we are currently deterred from doing anything in North Korea um, because we've had estimates for a while that they've had weapons, but also because they have enough artillery to kill hundreds of thousands or millions of people in Seoul. And it's why we've continuously behaved differently in North Korea. So we're already deterred from there. If we had a shield to protect ourselves, we still have to worry about our allies. And even if we have that shield to protect ourselves, I don't think any president is going to take that kind of a direct confrontation and risk with the chance that even one's going to come through. That's just my view. I'm really, I, sometimes I think I believe in deterrence more than Waltz does. Although the evidence I'm coming across, I'm going through this cognitive dissonance now where you know, the evidence is maybe cutting across. Now I, I, I might have to calculate what was the expected death rate of a World War III versus the smaller wars we got and try to, you know, figure this out a bit for myself. But there's not a clear-cut answer on it. I, I don't think it'll really – I'm in a minority. I don't think it makes a difference. I'm against it because I just think it's a waste of money. I would rather have us build up our counterinsurgency operations and our light fighters, and um, I think there's – better ways to use the money, but I don't have some big moral argument against it or that it's Star Wars, the militarization of space or anything like that. Did that answer your question? Probably more than answered it. I'll try to keep my answers shorter after that. Next question. My name's Lee Baxter. I'm not a student here. Does the data, do the data sets that you're using have enough precision in them to answer the question of quantification between a small number of large events or a large number of small events in other words, deterring one major war may offset hundreds or maybe thousands of small interactions. Do the data sets have that level um, of precision? They, they do. They do have coding in them for how many people died in the conflict. And so exactly what I'm going to do is you pull that out, you do the probabilities. This is the probability of having small wars in this world. This is the probability of having big wars in a nuclear, non-nuclear. And then you plug in those numbers and you do an estimate. I mean, my, my, back, of the, my back of the envelope estimate and... The, another thing I'd suggest people take a look at is the Human Security Report. If you Google it, it comes up right away. It's done by Canadian um, IR Institute. They've really found that since World War II, um, interstate battle deaths have declined precipitously. And, um, you know, so I, I, I have a little, I have really little doubt that this played a big role in deterring World War III. But that still doesn't make it right. I mean, you could make a, you could make a, a uh, just war argument that nuclear weapons 
are immoral, that we're planning to target civilians, that we've used them against civilians, and that even if tens of millions of soldiers would have died, they're soldiers, and they're drafted or they join voluntarily, but it conforms with Geneva Convention and the way that civilized society has said that they're going to express their atavistic or more violent side. And so that's kind of one of the arguments with dropping the bomb in Japan, right? I, I mean, I think the estimates are at least half a million um, Japanese would have died. I think it's actually closer to about 1.2, 1.3 million, and we would have lost you know, hun hundreds of thousands. Um, and the argument is, well, they would have been soldiers in collateral damage. That's different from directly targeting civilians. So I don't in any way want to say I'm, I'm ignoring or mitigating the moral arguments that could be made, but I don't think you could come up with a calculation that would show that all these small, small wars have in any way come close to what World War III would have meant between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. So you could theoretically calculate... So you could theoretically calculate an optimal amount of nuclear armament, I mean, give, given that kind of data. That becomes tougher because um, there's a big debate about how many weapons you need. I think you need 50. I think we should reduce our stockpile to 50. I think you put a few on some subs, you put a few on some trains, you have a few silos, a couple people with them in a backpack, and uh, we're okay. You know, that's enough of a deterrent threshold, you're safe. Waltz thinks it's a couple hundred, other people say it's 500. It's certainly not 1,000, 5,000, or 10,000, which um, there's a lot of weird pathologies about why states develop that many. Um, so it becomes more difficult to figure out what that threshold is. And there's also a strange thing. If nobody has nuclear weapons, there's some probability of war. If X number of states have them, war might go down between them but go up against the non-nuclear powers. But then if everybody had them, there might not be any major wars anymore, but there might be more accidents or ac accidental escalations. So it's actually quite complicated. Becomes a, it, to do it well, it's a very complicated equation where there's safety, there's accidental escalation, there's Al Qaeda grabbing one, there's all sorts of things that you'd want to put into the into the formula. Thanks. I want to preface my question with uh, the assertion that I agree with your research that uh, having nuclear weapons um, and the concept of nu uh, mutually assured destruction is, is a true concept. Um, I want to preface my question as well with um, a l little bit of history to set, it, to set it up. In 1975, OPEC said that US dollar was the, going to be the oil dollar. In uh, October 22nd, 2000, Saddam Hussein changed all his reserves into, um, into euros from dollars. Late 2002, um, the Bush administration said that uh, Iraq was seeking nuclear weapons. Of course, we know what happened to Iraq in 2003. And then in 2004, Iran uh, announced that they wanted to open up an oil exchange in Tehran, exchanging oil in euros. I, and, and they wanted to set it up in uh, March 2006. January 2006, Iran said, well, we're not going to do that because there was a lot of going on in the media at the time. But nevertheless, as of early 2007, last time I checked, 57% of their oil is converted from the dollar price to the euro price on a daily basis, and they sell their oil for euros. And um, judging by what happened after what Saddam Hussein did, that you know the, the dollar lost about 25% of its power against the euro um, in the following year after he switched his, res uh, his currency reserves, how, if this stuff is going on, if what I'm implying is going on, how much would this skew the results of whether or not having nuclear weapons promotes peace or destroys peace, and whether or not this standoff with Iran is really about nuclear weapons? <clears throat> A part of your question definitely goes beyond the scope of my paper, but let me try to encapsulate the piece that I think is directly pertinent. You're pointing to, I think you're pointing to a potential unintended consequence that when states try to acquire nuclear weapons, other states may try to go to war with them to prevent that. And that's something I'm not testing for. So there's a chance that the proliferation process itself might drive more conflicts. Um, <clears throat> but once they have weapons, apparently there's still even more conflict yet. So there's probably some interesting tests I can do to see um, there's some problems too with the con there's some, there's a way to test this called directed dyads where you can look at the dyad and see which party initiates the conflict. If you're right, states that are not acquiring the weapon will try to maybe attack people that are trying to acquire it. 
Um, the other question would just be whether the states that acquire them have been more prone to be in conflict, so they're stuck in some rivalry and they're getting them because they're worried about their neighbor. Um, so there's some, th some of what you're talking about, there are extra things I, I do want to look at and uh, test. Um, on the other issue, I'll just kind of throw my view out there. I'm not a fan of, of, uh, of I don't want to say what you put forward as a conspiracy theory, but I think that uh, Oliver Wilde said something like the amazing things about the world are the ones that are really right in front of us and not the more hidden or latent meanings. And um, <clears throat> there's lots of reasons why we went into um, Iraq. And there's lots of reasons why we don't want Iran to have um, nuclear weapons. I think a direct oil argument is really just far down the list of things. Um, Europe is much more oil dependent than we are. So if that kind of basic conspiracy theory is correct, the Europeans should have been in favor of invading Iraq and Iran. We're the world's third largest oil producer. And we're really far away. And we could reduce our oil dependency and start selling stuff to Europe and have more coercive leverage on them. I'm not saying I'm giving the right answer. I'm just saying there's so many complications with this sort of thing that I just think it's complex. I'd encourage everybody in here to Google an article, Foreign Policy, probably about 2002, by John Lewis Gaddis, lifelong Democrat, big critic of historically of Republicans. Um, but he wrote an article saying why he was sure we were going to regime change Iraq. And he mentioned Bernard Lewis and neoconservatives in a belief that the U.S. used its influence decisively to shape two continents that had had war for centuries, Asia and Europe, and that once the U.S. decisively used its influence and regime changed and occupied and put in democracies and capitalist systems, these two continents behaved differently. You can say it's dumb, it's misguided, the Middle East is different, they shouldn't have done it, but Gaddis lays out a very different motive for the Bush administration than what we conventionally debate. And unless he got in a time machine, he actually made that argument prior to us invading Iraq. So it's worth having a look at. Next question. Um, am I pointing to who's to in the? That, that'd be helpful, yeah. oh, okay. OK, sorry. You know what? I'll leave it up to you. When they raise their hands, you can bring the mic to whoever you want. Um, my name is Michael Bean. I'm from Idaho. And I'm an international relations major. Um, my question is, according to your data sets, um, the chances of war between two uh, nuclear countries is reduced. Um, and that just brings up the question, why, what do you think is the purpose and the significance be behind um, nuclear treaties that are signed between two nuclear countries, such as the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty that's been signed by many nuclear countries and the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty between the United States and Russia. What's the significance of them if nuclear arms are so, so good at deterring? Why do we want to get rid of them? Um, excellent question. I guess my basic view is I like to think about Chamberlain waving a piece of paper that Hitler and England were not going to go to war. So I, I think the significance of most treaties is purely symbolic. And we just live in a weird, we live in a very strange country where if we don't agree with a treaty, we don't sign it. Where if France doesn't agree with a treaty, they sign it and they ratify provisions that create loopholes to all the parts of the treaty. So we'd be a lot smarter to actually go into a lot more of these things. The non-proliferation treaty, the um, optimist view of it is, let's these aren't good things. Let's pro these aren't good things because of the accidents and bad guys getting them. So let's stop them from spreading. The more sinister view of it is, it's the countries with them trying to maintain theirs and telling other people that don't have them that they're not allowed to. So what the NPD really is, it's a status quo document that reinforces the current structure of power the same way the UN Security Council resolution does. Um, so there's kind of a haves, have-nots argument. Um, I, I personally am not convinced that these treaties really impair behavior that much. I think people, um, you know, like to find out, does AA work? You have to have a controlled study of the people that were really going to go in and sign up for AA if they just went off on their own. That's how you figure that out. And I haven't seen really good studies that have convinced me AA works. I haven't seen good studies that convince me that AA for nuclear states um, is having much of an impact. A lot of the arms reductions... Um, are uh, probably smart, they save money. But my biggest view on it is, you know, PR. I'm, I'm really shocked that Bush didn't sign. I mean, he signed. Bolton and other neocons have been very critical of what Bush has done with North Korea, which is basically 
almost the same framework that Clinton had signed. And I'm, I'm a big advocate of peace treaties. If I was going to if I was going to advise a president, I'd say sign them all the time. You, you go to Camp David, you sign them, you might even get a Nobel Prize. Everybody's happy and they clap. And then if the North Koreans behave poorly or if the Palestinians or Israelis behave poorly, you get to have another round of peace talks. And you bring them back in, you sign another document. Maybe, you get, maybe the next president gets another Nobel Prize. Whether these things are really having any effect doesn't matter. But politically, why people, why Bush took so long to sign a meaningless contract with North Korea when he's so low in the polls shocks me. I mean, from a purely Machiavellian standpoint, I would have said, you should have done this a couple years ago. Because people, this is brilliant, it's great, good job. And you can actually see him doing it right now in the, in the Middle East. And we'll see if anything, if anything comes from this. I mean, this is what I study as conflict management. I'm sorry to sound so jaded and cynical about it, but you know, we, how many Camp David Accords and Oslo and other stuff has there been between Israel and Palestine? They're going to have many, many more until there's a demographic change or a partitioning that's non-voluntary or just a slug. And, you know, until then, there'll be a few more Nobels, but that's about it. Um, I'll come back to you. we still got time for hopefully the three hands that were just up. Guy Allen, I'm a physics graduate of BYU, 1959. Um, anyway, I was born um, in 1971, so it's, <laughs> you've, you've, pulled, you've effectively pulled seniority. I'm going to listen very carefully. I have a comment to make um, in regards to, uh, to treaties and negotiations. I was a member of the U.S. delegation that negotiated the Threshold Test Ban Treaty with the Soviet Union. That treaty was signed, there were two treaties, but I'm just going to talk about one. The treaty was signed in 1974, and, but there were no provisions for verification. And in 1988, the Russians, the Soviets, agreed then to do a verification, That's which the key. we did. Yeah. Threshold test ban, yeah. or the, the uh, TTBT. Yeah. And so I had the opportunity to be a part of the team that went to the Soviet Union and measured the yield of one of their tests. The point I'm getting to without wanting to look that based upon our experience of us sending our scientists over to their test site, they're sending scientists to our test site, we became a lot more comfortable with each other mm -hmm. and there was a lot less um, What's the term I'm looking for? There was a lot less. Um, we were thinking that you know we we always thought the worst. Yeah, less less distrust, a better understanding of you know, motives and intentions. Yeah. That was the thing we were doing, and so my point that I would like to make is that if we if we build a nuclear shield and that would lead to opportunities for discussion, like with the Chinese or with whoever, there is a you increase your your opportunities for reducing the threat by having interactions rather than being distrustful of each other. I, I'm I'm 100% in favor of of, di of dialogue and stuff helping. But just like what you're saying, we signed lots of accords with the Soviets, and the Cold War continued until their own sclerosis caused them to. Well, you know, collapse. But, but but I agree with you. There's an ebb and a flow in the scientific contact. But, but part contact of the problem and, with that was that the Soviets would never agree to verification. Yeah, the verification. That's right. Trust you know, but verify, that, like you that said. That was the key. And, and so my question and my point that I would like to make is that our question for you is, as you showed your uh, your graph up there, that war was decreased isn't this the argument that we live with today is trying to reduce weapons of mass destruction? And that sort of puts all of those other seven blocks at a much lower level of, of threat than a weapon of mass destruction, which is where nuclear weapons fit. Thank you. Um, I'm actually struggling to make sure I fully understand what I'd kind of already interjected my first part on what I thought about the, the, the treaties. Um, 
weapons of mass, I mean, these results are ambiguous because on the one hand, it's saying they're really bad for everything but symmetric dyads. I think the question I need to answer is this gentleman's earlier question of what are really the effects? We're avoiding World War III, but maybe promoting lots of small conflicts. And maybe we're preempting to prevent the spread. And I, I just frankly don't have the data and haven't thought enough about um, what the deaths and likelihoods are of those events. And until I do, I'm, I'm actually just agnostic on it. So I'll, ha I'll have to dodge. If you don't mind, let's, do we still have time or are we at the, at the end to take a couple more? This gentleman's had his hand up for a long time. And who was it in back that's been up a long time? So we'll try to still do these two. My name is Spencer Pearson. I'm a Russian international relations major. My question for you is, based on the data that you have, would you be more in favor of everyone gaining nuclear weapons and then we have just symmetric dyads all around or nobody having them? I guess what I'm asking is, would you rather live in a world where everyone has nuclear weapons or where no one has nuclear weapons? And do you see that happening? I want to live in a world where the United States has nuclear weapons and nobody else does. <laughs> uh, I'm chauvinistic, I'll be honest. That's my, that's my ideal world. I say that without any embarrassment, and it's the, it's the honest truth. And then the uh, gentleman all the way in back. You gave me a dichotomy. I'm a professor. This is a I, really can take, I can take a third side of a two-sided issue. She already handed me the mic, so okay, it's a quick so question. So we'll try to get one more in back. Um, do you think, though, that, for example, with nuclear, North Korea or China, for example, that the issue of nuclear weapons and the defensiveness that it puts us in sort of to deal with that possible issue? Um, one of my question is, is, do you think the, the question of nuclear weapons puts us at more of a defensive posture towards these countries than we naturally would have if the nuclear weapons issue wasn't on the table? Like, are, are we more No, that, that, that's defensive? absolutely right, and it's a weird log roll. There's like a fixation, because it's both conservatives don't want our, our adversaries to have more power, period. But those on the left are also scared of nuclear weapons. So it's actually a perfect storm of bipartisan freaking out over proliferation. So this is where Ken Walt says, calm down. This isn't the worst thing. The fear of nuclear weapons is possibly going to be worse than actually a few states getting them. And I guess the critics of the Iraq war might say, what would it you know, would it have been worse if he actually would have gotten them? I personally think yes, for various reasons, but you could make the argument, no, we wouldn't have regime changed them. There could be more civilians alive. Um, you know, so I, I can see the other side. And the mic is now in the appropriate uh, yes. hand. My name is Joe Vasicek. I'm a, a political science major from Massachusetts. And I know um, a lot of what we're seeing nowadays is not necessarily conventional warfare, but asymmetrical warfare between um, groups, especially like Al-Qaeda, that don't actually have a territory to defend, but they're actually um, like NGOs that we're mm -hmm. fighting. Uh, did your study take into account conflicts between uh, states and between stateless, uh, stateless organizations like Al-Qaeda? Um, no, they didn't. But they might indirectly, and you're pointing out something very interesting, um, because I, I don't buy the non-territoriality of terrorists as much. They, they're physical people that exist in our time-space continuum. So they're actually occupying a place. So when they attack us out of Afghanistan, we go to Afghanistan. When they attack us out of Somalia, Clinton did a missile strike into Somalia. So we actually can go after them. So it still might show up this way. But there is something called extraterritoriality conflict. There is a data set that gets at this question. And what you're pointing to is interesting is that when you become, you know, it, when the, if you mess with a bull, you get the horns. So the U.S. is really big and we're dominant. The, un the underbelly to all this stuff is that people are going to have to come up with other ways to try to hit you. And it's almost like you can see piracy. And, you know, piracy is the way you deal with the British Navy. Terrorism is the way you deal with the U.S. Um, but I'm still hopefully picking up some of it. But it's a, it's a good, good question.